Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of League, Lore, and More. I'm your host, Funky Order, and this week we continue the Shreeman storyline with the Butcher of the Sands, Renekton, an ascended god warrior in the form of a massive reptilian. Renekton is brother to fellow god warrior being Nasus, and their story together is one of tragedy. Before we jump in, just a quick thanks to all the listeners, and if you are interested more in visual representation of what we are discussing, these episodes are uploaded to YouTube with images for characters and places that I think are important to include. If that is something you find beneficial, then head over to YouTube and search for League, Lore, and More, or find my channel under Funky Odor. That being said, we can now move on to the main story that everyone is here for, the tale of the Killer Croc. As always, after the biography and the story, we'll dive into our comparison for the week. So here is Renekton. As I live, all will die. Renekton was born to fight. From a young age, it was obvious he had no fear, regularly brawling with much older children. It was usually his pride that led to these confrontations. Renekton was unable to back down or let any insult pass. While his older brother Nasus disapproved of his street fighting, Renekton relished it. Nasus eventually left to join the prestigious Collegium of the Sun, and Renekton's skirmishes became more serious. Fearing his brother's violent nature would see him imprisoned or in an early grave, Nasus helped him enlist in the Shuriman army. Officially, Renekton was too young, but Nasus made sure this was conveniently overlooked. The discipline of the military life was a blessing. Renekton fought in numerous wars of conquest to expand the empire. His ferocity and toughness were still evident, but his honor and bravery became renowned. Nasus, now a celebrated general and tactician, would often say that he planned many great battles, but it was Renekton who won them. Indeed, after saving the isolated city of Zaretta, Renekton was made a captain by the emperor himself and named gatekeeper of Shurima. Outnumbered ten to one, he and a small contingent had faced the enemy in the remote, rocky passes to the south to buy time for the city to be evacuated. It was a battle none had expected Renekton to survive, let alone win. Yet he held out long enough for a relief force led by Nasus to arrive, and the invading forces were routed. Through decades of service, Renekton's reputation came to rival even the god warriors of the Ascended Host. His presence on the battlefield an inspiration to those fighting alongside him, and terrifying to his foes. Still, he was a grizzled and battle-scarred veteran of middling years when word reached him that his brother was close to death. Before we continue, um, I just want to read an excerpt from the uh, Lore Companion book, uh, just reminding us what uh, the god warriors are. The Ascended were mighty heroes, peerless tacticians, and cunning sorcerers chosen to lead the armies of Shurima in battle. It was said that entire campaigns could be won the moment a god warrior took to the field because their foes chose to turn and flee rather than face them directly. So at this point, Renekton is not an Ascended god warrior. Um, we will see that he will become one. And knowing the image of Renekton after he becomes ascended as this massive crocodile uh, reptilian figure, then it's kind of obvious that uh, if I if I was on the opposite side of the battlefield, then I would uh, 100% probably run away if that thing uh, walked uh, anywhere near me. Um, anyway, getting back to the story with Nessus being sick, sick and close to death, Renekton raced back to the capital to find Nasus, a pale shadow of his former self, having been struck down by a de debilitating, wasting malady. The sickness was incurable. Nevertheless, the general's greatness was recognized by one and all. Beyond his military acumen, Nasus had curated the Empire's great libraries and compiled or translated many of the finest literary works of antiquity. Such a man could not be allowed to pass, and it was decreed that he was worthy of ascension. The whole city gathered in witness, but Nasus no longer had the strength to climb onto the dais before the sun disk. Without the thought for his own safety, Renekton lifted his brother in his arms and climbed the final steps. 
fully expecting to be obliterated in the process. He was just a warrior, after all, and he knew Shirima would need Nasus in the years to come. However, Renekton was not destroyed. Beneath the blinding radiance of the sun disk, both brothers were raised up and remade, and when the light faded, two mighty god warriors stood before the crowds. Nasus in his lean, jackal-headed body, and Renekton as an immense reptile. Jack the jackal was often regarded as the most clever and cunning of beasts, and the fearless aggression of the crocodile fit Renekton perfectly. Renekton had been a mighty hero before, but now he possessed power beyond mortal understanding. He led Shirima's armies to many bloody victories, neither giving nor accept, expecting any mercy. His legend spread far beyond the borders of the Empire, and it was his enemies that knew him as the Butcher of the Sands, a title he embraced. But there were some, Nasus among them, who came to believe that a portion of Renekton's humanity had been lost in the transformation. He seemed crueler, taking ever greater pleasure in the spilling of blood, and there were whispers of many battlefield atrocities. Nevertheless, he remained a staunch defender of Shrima, faithfully serving a succession of emperors even through the rebellion of Acathia and the horrifying war that followed. Some years later, it was decided that the young Emperor Azir would join the ranks of the Ascended Host and become the immortal ruler his people deserved. The results were catastrophic. Renekton and Nasus were each more than a day's journey from the capital when it happened, and they arrived to find the glorious city in ruins. The sun disk was failing, drained of all its power. At the center of the carnage, they found the Emperor's treacherous mages, Zarath, now a malevolent being of pure energy. The brothers fought hard, but knowing that they could not destroy Zarath, Renekton finally wrestled him into the tomb of the emperors beneath the city and bade his brothers seal them inside. Knowing there was no other way, Nasus reluctantly did as his brother ordered. Zarath and Renekton continued their battle. For uncounted centuries, they stalked one another through the lightless depths as the once great civilization of Shirima turned to dust in the world above. Zerath taunted his adversary, whispering poison in Renekton's ear, and gradually, his viperous words began to take hold. He convinced Renekton that Nasus, jealous of his success, had leapt at the chance to be rid of him and enjoy immortality alone. Piece by piece, Renekton's sanity cracked. Zerath drove a wedge into these cracks, twisting his perception of what was real and what was imagined. When the Tomb of the Emperors was finally opened by greedy mortal scavengers, Renekton soared his fury and thundered out into the desert, sniffing the air for his brother's scent. But Shirima was cha has changed much in his absence. The Ascended Host is no more, leaving the people scattered and leaderless for the most part. Though he, though he cares little for such things, Renekton has attracted followers among the most fierce and bloodthirsty of the desert raiders, even if he cannot always tell friend from foe in his frequent, deranged frenzies. And while there are moments when he resembles the proud, honorable, honorable hero of the past, most often Renekton is little more than a devolved, hate-maddened beast driven on by the thirst for blood and vengeance. So, and near the end here we get, uh, again, uh, them saying what happened when they're in the tomb uh, with Zareth uh, just, you know, speaking into Renekton's ear, whispering things about how Nessus betrayed him and left him in there on purpose. Uh, and, you know, when you're in there for centuries, for millennia, you're going to forget the actual events of what happened the day you entered into the, the tomb. And that's what happens with Renekton. And so when the tomb's opened, he goes out and find, or is seeking out Nasus to destroy him. And I think, I couldn't find the, the audio quote from, for the champion, uh, but Renekton, I think when you ban him in the game, I think it's his ban quote, I think he says, like, Nessus cannot escape me forever, or something like that. Um, so that's his goal once uh, the tomb is unlocked by Sivir. Uh, and I mean, it says greedy mortal scavengers here, um, so I'm not sure if there's just inconsistency in 
the writing of the lore. Um, again, this biography is found on the universe.leagueoflegends.com uh, website, which has all the lore of all the champions. So I'm not sure if there's a difference in the writers or if they just are also saying that Sibber, um, and I think the champion Cassiopeia is also present when the tomb is unlocked. Uh, Sivir and her are greedy mortal scavengers or not, but that is a discrepancy that I just found. Um, anyway, so Nasus becomes a, a jackal-type figure, which, again, is just really hammering home the whole uh, Shirima is ancient Egypt vibe that we're getting. Uh, ancient Egypt, obviously, there's tons of depictions of jackal uh, like humanoid figures uh, or human figures with jackal heads which is what Nessus's ascended being that's the form that it is now all three of the people that we've covered so far so Renekton, Azir, and Zarath are, are all at some point in their lives ascended beings and so we need to understand also that so they have just regular human forms um, prior to the ascension and then Azir becomes um, something of like a, 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 a bird type character. Uh, he's got, I mean, if you play the character or see the character played, um, some of his emote uh, abilities that you can do make him uh, walk uh, like a bird or like do some of the bird sounds. Um, and then Zerath is just this being of energy and then there's these like shards of metal like all around him that kind of give him like a, a form and that is what last week we discovered was the uh um not mausoleum it was the um sarcophagus that they initially trapped him in that Nessus and renekton initially trapped him in that he broke free of but the uh shards and the chains stuck to him i guess stuck to his being of energy uh so it, it it's nice that they did that though because it gives him more shape and you know you can see like a face kind of um and then nasus and renekton renekton being this massive uh crocodile and but still having like still walking on two legs and carrying weapons in his hands and then nasus being uh an armored jackal uh, type figure so just not all of the characters that are in stream and lore that are characters in the game are going to be ascended beings but so far they all have been but it's good to know that this is like uh not their normal for it is normal now for them since they're essentially immortal um beings but this wasn't always the way they looked but um, now let's read the story. It's called Darkness Renews uh, about Renekton, also found on the Universe website. Um, so here it is. Am I a god? He no longer knows. Once, perhaps, when the sun just gleamed like gold atop the great palace of 10,000 pillars, he remembers carrying a withered ancient in his arms and them both born into the sky by the sun's radiance. All his hurts and pain were washed away as the light remade him. If this memory is his, then was he once mortal? He thinks so, but cannot remember. His thoughts are a cloud of dune flies, myriad shattered memories buzzing angrily in his elongated skull. What is real? What am I now? This place, this cave under the sands, is it real? He believes so, but he is no longer sure he can trust his senses. For as long as he can remember, he knew only darkness, awful, unending darkness that clung to him like a shroud. But then the darkness broke apart, and he was hurled back into the light. He remembers clawing his way through the sand as the earth buckled and heaved, the living rock grinding as something long buried and all but forgotten heaved itself to the surface once again. Towering statues erupted from beneath the sand, vast and terrible in their aspect. Armored warriors with demonic heads loomed over him, ancient gods of a long-dead culture. 
Bellicose phantoms rose from the sand and he fled their wrath, escaping the rising city as light blazed and the moons and stars wheeled overhead. He remembers staggering through the desert, his mind afire with visions of blood and betrayal, of titanic palaces and golden temples brought down in the blink of an eye. Centuries of progress undone for the sake of one man's vanity and pride. Was it his? He does not know, but fears it might have been. The light that once remade his flesh now pains him. It burned him raw and seared his soul as he wandered the desert, lost and alone, tormented by a hatred he did not understand. He has taken refuge from its unforgiving light, but even here, squatting and weeping in this dripping cave, the whisper has found him. The shadow on the walls slithers around him, always muttering, always conspiring to feed his bitterness. He presses long, gnarled hands that end in vicious, Ivan talents to his temples, but he cannot shut his constant companion in the darkness out. He never could. The whisperer tells tales of his shame and guilt. It speaks of the thousands who died because of him, who never had the chance to live thanks to his failure. A part of him believes these to be honeyed falsehoods, twisted fictions told often enough that he can no longer sift truth from lies. The whisperer reminds him of the light being shut away, showing him the jackal face of his betrayer looking down as he condemned him to the abyssal dark for all eternity. Tears gather at the corners of his cataracted eyes and he angrily wipes them away. The whisperer knows every secret path into his mind, twisting every certainty he once clung to, every virtue that made him the hero revered as a god throughout Shurima. That name has meaning to him but it fades like a shimmering mirage remaining bound within the prison of his mind by chains of madness. His eyes, once so clear-sighted and piercing, are misted with the eons he spent in the endless dark. His skin was as tough as armored bronze, but is now dull and cracked, dust spilling from his many wounds like sand from an executioner's hourglass. Perhaps he is dying. He thinks he might be, but the thought does not trouble him overmuch. He has lived in age and suffered too long to fear extinction. Worse, he is no longer sure he can die. He looks at the weapon before him, a crescent-bladed axe without a handle. It belonged to a warrior king of Acathia, but a fleeting memory of breaking its half as he had broken its bearer's army returns to him. He remembers remaking it, but not why. Perhaps he will use it to slice open his rigid throat and see what happens. Will blood or dust flow? No, he will not die here. Not yet. The Whisperer tells him fate has another role for him. He has blood yet to spill, a thirst for vengeance yet to slake. The jackal face of the one who condemned him to darkness floats in his mind, and each time he sees it, the hatred carved on his heart boils to the surface. He looks up at the cave walls as the shadows part, revealing the crude daubings of mortals. Ancient, flaking images so faded as to be almost invisible depict the desert city in all its glory. Rivers of cold, clear water flow in its pillared thoroughfares, and the life-giving rays of the sun bring forth wondrous greenery from a newly fertile landscape. He sees a king in a hawk-headed helm atop a towering palace and a dark-robed figure at his side. Beneath them are two giants in armor wrought for war, one in a hawk hulking crocodilian beast armed with a crescent-bladed axe, and other a jackal-headed warrior scholar. In the reptilian form, he recognizes a mortal's awed representation of his ascended incarnation. He turns his gaze upon the remaining warrior. Time has all but erased the angular script beneath the faded image, but enough is still legible for him to make out his betrayer's name. Nasus, he says. Brother, and with the source of his torment named, his own identity is revealed like the sun emerging from a storm cloud. I am Renekton, he hisses through hooked teeth, the butcher of the sands. He lifts his crescent blade and rises to his full height as, his, as the dust of ages falls away from his armored form. Old wounds seal, broken skin knits afresh, and color returns to his supple jade crocodilian skin as purpose fills him. Once the sun remade him, but now darkness is his ally. Strength surges through his monstrously powerful body, muscles swelling and eyes burning red with hatred for Nasus. He hears the whisperer speak once again, but he no longer heeds its voice. 
He clenches a clawed fist and touches the tip of his blade to the image of the jackal-headed warrior. You left me alone in the darkness, brother, he says. You will die for that betrayal. The end. Um, so... This guy's got some issues, uh, and the Whisperer the thing, the character that is mentioned as the Whisperer is what we know of as Zarath now, just whispering evil things into his ear and tricking him to think that Ness has betrayed him. And so now this seems to take place from when the tomb is opened and he's, he's seeing, you know, light for the first time in however long. And then him going out into the world knowing remembering who it was that sealed them in there even though it was Renekton that knew that that was the only way to keep Zerath uh, locked away from the world um, but again it's been multiple centuries, millennia and so you forget that and Zerath is like uh, you know he's like Grima Wormtongue in speaking into the ear of King Theoden in Lord of the Rings. He's He's been there so long that in Renekton's mind was so fragile that uh, all the trickery and lies um, took their hold and, and worked. We're also getting multiple references now between Renekton's story here and then also in his biography and then with Azir and maybe also in Zerath, Zerath's story, but mentions of the rebellion of Akathia, which is something that we will get to. Um, it might come up again in this storyline, but uh, there will probably be you know, a series in and of itself on Akathia and champions that are uh, from that area, even though you might consider them Shuriman since a part of Shurima, but I believe it. I believe it's got its own uh, um, story to it that we will dive into. But um, that's obviously not going to be this week. Um, so now we can get into the comparison of this week, um, and we're kind of merging two into one. So I like to do two uh, figures, whether from movies and stuff or from history, but we're gonna take, we're gonna run with this uh, Star Wars uh, theme that we have going on here, like last week, like, uh, comparing Zara's life to the life of Anakin Skywalker, but I feel like the Anakin Obi-Wan theme fits even just as perfectly with Renekton and Nasus. Uh, but so as not to rehash that, we can adopt the comparison of Renekton to that of Kylo Ren or Ben Solo as he's known before he becomes evil just like Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader. Uh, Kylo Ren in the sequel trilogy which came out in the 2010s and is the worst trilogy of films I've ever seen. Um, and let me just get into that kind of real quick, because I, I just like sharing my opinion on these movies and how terrible they are. Um, Kylo Ren being the one bright spot in all of the films, uh, just Adam Driver being a good actor. But the, the movies are just a complete remake of the original trilogy like in a force awakens it's like oh my gosh there's this evil force that's trying to conquer the galaxy called the first order instead of the galactic empire and they have this humongous thing called star killer base aka the death star which does the same exact thing as the death star except oh this one can destroy multiple planets at the same time instead of just one like the death star did like, come on. It's like, oh, and then we got to do a, a mission with just 
a few, you know, we got a few ragtag teams of of fighter pilots that are going to go and take this thing out, and, you know, there's, uh, it's so annoying, and then The Last Jedi, which is the worst of the films, um, just with the whole Snoke character, which is very much indicative of what Xerath is to Renekton while they're in the Tomb of the Emperors, um, just, which is how this is a good representation, even though Snoke as a character was terrible. Um, and you never get the backstory of him until they're like, and then they kill him, like in The Last Jedi. And he's had like five minutes of screen time, but it's just a very mysterious character, and people had all these theories about him after The Force Awakens. Like, oh, who is he? Where did he come from? And it's like, no, we're just going to kill him. And then in The Rise of Skywalker, number nine, it's like, oh, it was actually Palpatine the whole time, and Snoke is just like this body that was created by Palpatine, and then his mind is controlling it, and it's like, that's just so stupid. Um, and then number nine with, uh, oh, wait, oh, what happens in number uh, six? Oh, the Emperor dies. Oh, what happens in number nine? Oh, the Emperor dies. Um, Emperor Palpatine, and... It's just like, oh, and the rebellion, everyone comes together and, and, and fights together to beat the First Order and to win. And it's just like, yeah, duh. Like, why couldn't you have any other type of storyline? Oh, yeah, and in The Last Jedi with the battle between Kylo Ren and Luke Skywalker. Like, they're on that planet, which I think it's like a salt planet, but like, Oh, it's a salt planet, so the ground is white, just like the Battle of Hoth in The Empire Strikes Back. Like, I don't get how people got paid tons and tons of money to be so lazy. I don't get it. Like, they had no creativity when it came to this. It was just completely just rehashing everything that went on in the original trilogy. And it pissed me off. Um... Because it was a waste of like seven to eight hours of my life, depending on how long the movies are. There is that scene at the end of The Last Jedi, though, the fight between Kylo Ren and Luke Skywalker. Even though it's not Luke Skywalker, it's a Force ghost projection of Luke Skywalker that he can apparently do while he was still living, even though he then disappears into the Force at the end of the film. But, but the dialogue between them... Uh, I think it's really something that you might hear between Renekton and Nasus where they were, was Renekton able to, you know, find Nasus when he gets out of the tomb of the emperors and goes out into the world seeking his revenge on him, which is another thing that kind of bothers me with all this, like all this lore is just kind of, all just set up on cliffhangers like there's no <laughs> resolution uh as far as i know written to it um it's all just like a huge setup to this to something in the future that hopefully they add on to but like with azir and zarath like they've both ascended and they've both been you know azir reborn and zarath freed from the tomb but then that's where that ends you know azir's about to raise Shurima from the ground and restore it and but but he hasn't yet like that's that's not done yet um so a lot of cliffhangers that hopefully get resolved in the future but let's listen to the dialogue between Luke and Kylo and relate it to what we think would be a similar situation to uh Nasus and Renekton did you come back to say you forgive me to save my soul? No. I can totally just see <laughs> that being what Renekton says to Nasus. Um, 
you know, saying, like, oh, are you going to try and save my soul? And then, which I think Ness is, I'm not sure entirely on his mindset about the whole situation, but I feel like he probably would try, um, even though that's what Luke is trying to do. Um, he says no, but in the end, that's the end goal, is that he he knows the outcome. And then, you know, lightsabers get brandished, just like, you know, I'm sure Nessus and Renekton are going to have a brawl, uh, like I'm sure they did when they were younger brothers, but um, let's play the end of their con Luke and Kylo's conversation to really, to really bring home this uh, comparison between them. I failed you, Ben. I'm sorry. I'm sure you are. The resistance is dead. The war is over. And when I kill you, I will have killed the last Jedi. First of all, uh, I really feel like Kylo Ren sounds a lot like Renekton. And just, also, he's such a such an angsty teenager in these films. Like, when Luke just said that he was sorry, it's like, I bet you are. It's like, that's something a 13-year-old would say, and not someone who's supposed to be, like, a grown man who is the most powerful, one of the most powerful beings in the <laughs> entire universe. Just like, ah, I, bet, I bet you are sorry. Uh, to his, you know, former teacher and mentor, but, you know, that's probably something along those lines that Renekton would say when, you know, Nessus is saying that he's sorry for what he had to do. And then Renekton, you know, continuously threatening him like uh, Kylo Ren does with the existence of the Resistance and the, the Last Jedi. He, you know, threatening to extinguish them, which he nearly does. But, yeah, Kylo Ren's journey from, you know, being born to Han and Leia as Ben Solo, and then being sent to go train with Luke, uh, you know, at the Jedi Temple, I feel like is very parallel to Renekton uh, being enlisted in the military by Nasus to keep him out of trouble. Uh, I'm sure Han and Leia could no longer really give the structure that Kylo or that Ben needed f when he was experiencing his, you know, f abilities with the force uh, and the power that the, that that entailed. And then like Kylo or Ben, while he's training under Luke and all these years are going by, there's this whisper in his head, right? And this whisper is uh, Supreme Leader Snoke of the First Order, but which we then learn is actually Palpatine just speaking into his ear and basically tricking him over into, into joining the dark side, just like Emperor Palpatine did with Anakin Skywalker in the prequel trilogy, eventually becoming Darth Vader. He he's getting Kylo to doubt Luke and to doubt the way of the light, the way of the Jedi and, and turning him to the dark side. And just like with Zarath and Renekton, even though we've compared Zarath to Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader in the last week's episode, he really takes on the role of uh, Emperor Palpatine uh, or uh, Supreme Leader Snoke uh, once they're in the tomb of, you know, being that world of the Whisperer, like we saw in the story of Renekton, whispering stuff into Renekton's ear and over time gradually tricking him and just destroying his, his mind and his mental ability to realize that what he's feeling towards Nasus isn't the, the correct thing to feel. Um, Nessus didn't do that intentionally. Like, he, well, he didn't want to leave Renekton down there, but both him and Renekton knew that that was the only way to keep Zarath from escaping. And but then over time, with the the whispers of Zarath, Renekton forgets that that's what happened and just sees that Nessus, you know, betrayed him and locked him down in there because he was jealous of him or 
kind of feared him or just didn't like him. And that's sad, but that's uh, the way it, it works. And just like we saw with when we were comparing Theon, Greyjoy, to Xerath in last week's episode, Theon redeemed himself in the end of the show, even how crappy an ending to the show Game of Thrones was. I need to stop comparing things to stuff that I dislike. Uh, I should <laughs> find things that I enjoy uh, completely more, even though I enjoy Star Wars, I just and I was entertained by the movies. I just think that the storylines were crappy uh, and, and insulting, kind of, to, to the fans. Anyway, enough about that. Um, so instead of doing like a Theon Greyjoy and then Anakin like I did last week, I just wanted to basically Renekton growing up is like Ben Solo and then Renekton in the tomb and then when he escapes from the tomb he is Kylo Ren. This kind of warmongering, vicious, bloodthirsty uh, warrior who is very powerful and few can challenge him. And he's got these thoughts in his head that have no real foundation, but have been planted there by the Whisperer. And so that's going to conclude our focus on Renekton, but he's going to be a major character next week uh, in the story of Nasus that, that we're going to cover since Nasus, uh, you know, appeared in basically every paragraph of the stories this week uh, with Renekton. Uh, it's a very close bond, and I'm not sure if everyone who like would play the game would know that the, those two are brothers or not, but especially since Riot doesn't do a great job themselves of pushing the lore. Uh, I mean, it's not something that's going to make them a ton of money, but regardless, um, thanks to everyone who listened. I appreciate everyone for supporting the podcast. Uh, again, if you want this visually, you can find this on YouTube. Search for Funky Odor or the title of the video. And more of my content is on twitch.tv slash thatfunkyodor. And feel free to suggest things for the podcast to me at funkyodorgaming at gmail.com. All these links will be in the description. Uh, and join me again in one week as we look at the curator of the sands Nessus. so we had the butcher of the sands today in Renekton and the curator of the sands next week with Nessus uh, as we continue and we're, I, I think we're probably near near the halfway point of our Shuriman characters but I'm not positive uh, we're getting close to the halfway point so it's still a long way to go for Shurima and hopefully we tie in all of these storylines uh, together and can have some kind of resolution or if it's just going to be more cliffhangers then it's going to be more cliffhangers but also I'm going to try and uh, include more from the uh, the lore book about kind of Shurim and culture and what it looks like where I can since we didn't cover every single thing uh, in that first episode but thanks for listening and I will see you guys next week